<laughs> hey guys, Z-Dog MD, welcome to the show. Dr. Peter Valenzuela, welcome, brother. Thanks so much, appreciate you having me here. Man, so Peter, the way we got connected is like, you. first of all, we worked for the same institution for a while. Which Sutter shall Health. not be named. Oh, sorry. Well, okay, we can't say it? No, we can say it. Oh, are you sure? Yeah, let's do it. Go right. for well, it. we just did. So, <laughs> uh, so you know, we, we, we both worked um, with those guys and you were in leadership uh, up in Northern Cali. And since then you wrote a book. Yes. And we became buddies because <laughs> it's all about that, like physicians using creativity to point out what's wrong with our system. Yeah. And this is this is why. So a lot of people are like, well, "Why you guys just keep complaining about what's wrong?" It's like, no, no, no. Ninety nine percent of solving this problem is naming it yeah. correctly, right? Yeah. And so you wrote a book called Doc Related, and you didn't wrote it necessarily. Is that the past tense of right? Um, it, <laughs> it has been written. It has been written. You wrote it and you illustrated it because what people need to know is that you are an artist, and it, this is basically like the Dilbert for medicine. Yeah. Yeah, actually, it's funny. I started with the comics first, and um, and then as I kept drawing comics, the more I wanted to tell the story as to why I, I was writing the comics. And you know, and I owe that to you because you know those when you started with your music videos, it was just a medium that was unusual, especially for healthcare, and it kind of inspired me to think in a creative way of how do we share our story about what's broken. That's kind of awesome. <laughs> yeah. No, man, you're yeah. my inspiration. Well, I mean, but this is why this is why I thought this was so interesting because you were using art to manifest in a, in, a, in a humorous way, but also very incisive, you know, what drives us crazy in healthcare. And um, by the way, I gotta, I gotta give a shout out to your wife. Um, she brought, she makes wine too. <laughs> yeah, she does. Look at this. What is, oh, there it is. Woo girl, <laughs> where is it? So we, we've, uh, we've been having a few sips of the bubbly yeah, here. This a is a little bubbly. It's a Pinot Noir uh, sparkling wine, Pinot Noir yeah, based thanks, rosé. Yeah, Vivian started her label earlier this year, so, you know. So, Having lived in Sonoma County, she really kind of got into it. When so, we were there. so both of you guys are taking the creative aspect of life and actually just inhabiting it now. Because you're currently the medical director, the chief medical officer for Mercy Medical Group up in Sacramento. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so you moved recently, and and part of it was you know be closer to that sort of winemaking experience and be able to do that, but also you know, it just was a good fit for you in terms of leadership, because what people need to understand is you're not, you're a family medicine doc, but you're also in healthcare administration. Yeah. And what's that true. been like? You know, it's, it's a little schizophrenic. You know, most people are like, you're either this or you're that, but you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be both. Mm. You know, I still see patients, I still practice medicine, uh, but now I kind of help to um, oversee a medical group of about 500 physicians. And and I think that a lot of that is really being able to speak their language and understand where the headaches are and do my best to try to help support that and, and help address the problems. So this is what's crazy because this book, <laughs> which people should check, it's on Amazon, we'll put a link. Yeah, It's nuts because that someone in leadership in healthcare is naming these problems as clearly and incisively as this is insane to me. Yeah. It's a sign that we're actually gonna approach Health 3.0 because when even leaders can openly say, here are all the problems and we need to work on these together, then we're in a position to actually change the problems. Yeah, I agree completely. I think for the most part, we've just kind of, most people learn to deal with it. And, and I, I don't think we should learn to deal with it. I think we need to figure out how to solve it, right? What do we do differently? How do we make things better for our patients and for our physicians and clinicians and the people on the front line? Yeah, and you know, look at the, just the chapters here, man, like health insurance, will this be covered? Prior authorization. Well, tell me about health insurance. Will this be covered, man? Oh, why man. Did, you, why Jeez, did you write that chapter? Gosh, don't even get me started. <laughs> I think a lot of docs right now are dealing with patients who have high deductible health plans. And the first thing patients ask when you're seeing them and you say, you know, I really think maybe an MRI or CT might be helpful for you. Is for those people that are having to shoulder more out-of-pocket costs, the first thing they say is, how much is that? Mm. And I think what's challenging for docs is that not all of us know the prices, of these things. And, and unfortunately, we live with EMRs that don't give you that type of information. We should have an EMR that says this person has this health insurance and this plan and this deductible and this is what we think it's going to be. Instead, we're kind of left with, well, um, you know, we could call and check around or maybe it'd be good for you to call. And it's, 
it's it's just part of what the insanity of what we have to deal with on a regular basis. Dude, it's like one thing that technology is good at is aggregating things like prices yeah. and doing the algorithmic stuff that doesn't require humans. Totally. Doesn't require humans yeah. to do that. Mm -hmm. And what you're asking now is you're asking physicians who are super busy, already mm -hmm. data overloaded, they're already data entry clerks, you're asking them to also be the arbiter of the finances for the patient. Now, this is the thing. If they don't do that and no one does that, you're committing financial assault on this patient mm -hmm. because they have no idea what this is gonna cost. Yeah. And nobody does that. Even mechanics don't do that. They give you an estimate, right? Yeah. So the lack of price transparency and the lack of the physician's ability to know that answer creates a kind of moral distress. It does. And so what you said about why can't the EHR just do this? Why yeah. can't it? I have no idea. I mean, I, I think there's 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 platforms out there now that are getting a lot better at being able to identify prices for for patients <clears throat> and and for consumers and you know and and I I still grimace a little bit when I use the word consumer because I <laughs> as a physician you know you see patients and you want to do what's best for them but now we talk about consumer driven care and unfortunately a lot of our consumers aren't educated enough or informed enough to be able to make some of those key decisions so we need to partner with our physicians and clinicians to help support that. You know, there was a study recently, I forget exactly where, but they were looking at doctors, or maybe it was an article written by someone. Even physicians can't make consumer level choices in healthcare. They don't have the information necessary to do it. And when they're patients, the power dynamic changes and they become as helpless as anyone else a lot mm -hmm. of the time. So if our own physicians can't do it, how can we ask our patients to be educated consumers when they don't have access to transparent data? Yeah, I, you know, that, I think you said it really well. I mean, I. I kind of hobbled in today, right? Yeah. Because I had arthroscopic knee surgery on Thursday. And uh, I got to say, you know, I, even myself, I was really struggling with, okay, what is the explanation of benefits here and what's covered and what's not? And I signed off on a few things. And, and now I'm like thinking, I, I'm sure in the next month, I'm probably going to get two or three bills. And I don't know how much of that is going to be covered, but I, I, wish, I wish there was a way to really understand that ahead of time so that we don't have to deal with it on the back end. Yeah. I mean, I've had the same struggles and I've talked about them publicly and I've had people on the show talking about this, Marshall Allen and others, Marty McCary talking yeah. about price transparency. I mean, it's a huge problem. And so when you when you started writing this book, I bet you got pushback from others in leadership <laughs> because basically what you're saying is, is you know, here are all our problems. And, and it's not just externalizing it to insurance companies and prior auths and things like that. It's also leadership stuff, yeah, right? Which we'll talk about. But so did you get a lot of crap for this? Uh, you know, I did. You know, it's yeah. funny. I, I have people who have followed my comics for years and they love my comics. And, you know, they like you said, it, it's, you know, it's been called the Dilbert for Healthcare. And you have a website that we can send people I to, do. Doc Related. Yeah, yeah, yeah docrelated.com. And it's got all of my comics in there. And it and the comics vary from, from EMR to leadership to provider performance to patient satisfaction to pre-authorization. All those things that you would see in a daily part of – as part of your daily work as a physician. And um, they're more satirical, right? They're the yeah. headaches that we deal with. Yeah. And I've had some physicians, and I shouldn't say physicians, I've had some administrators and managers that are not clinicians who've come to me and said, you know, I really feel like you're taking a jab at administrators here. Mm. And, and what I tell them is I'm not taking a jab at people, you know, directly. I'm actually dealing with the headaches of healthcare. Right, mm -hmm. what I'm what I'm talking about, what I'm creating, what I'm drawing, what what the comics we're making are based on what people across the United States are dealing with every day in healthcare situations, and I think that for the most part, being on both sides as an administrator and a physician, I can laugh at some of this. You know, I know the schizophrenia that goes on behind behind the curtain, the discussions that are had. Um, away from from patient care that most people aren't aware of, mm, you know, mm. and it gets pretty dicey. It gets dicey because you're having to make compromises, <clears throat> and you're trying to keep the lights on. You're trying mm -hmm. to keep employees, staff, doctors happy. You're trying to take care of patients. You're trying to deal with compliance and regulation, um, all those things, yeah. and they can pull you in different ways. People don't understand this as well as they understand it for say doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, physical therapists, that moral injury happens with administrators too. Yeah. And a lot, especially with clinical administrators who know our obligation to the patient better than anybody, right? So <clears throat> it's interesting, you've kind of, you've, you've outlined this thing into three parts, part one, two, three, and one is human dynamics. And 
so you kind of in chapter one like introduce all the characters, right? Who are some of the characters that you have? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've got I've got multi generational, multicultural uh, physicians and clinicians and administrators that are all. It's basically the setting of if you're going to do an office space for a clinic, that's basically what you got, right? Yeah. You've got a manager um, named Donna who's kind of the person that oversees the day to day affairs of the clinical operations. You've got a physician leader in Dr. Stevens. Um, you've got an older doc who was recently acquired um, in Dr. Katz. And, and between the two of us, Dr. Katz seems to get the most amount of uh, um, reads and reviews because patients seem to relate to him or people seem to relate to him the most. He's, he's just somebody that's in his early 60s who was recently acquired, who really is nostalgic for the old ways of practicing medicine that wasn't EMR driven, that was really a lot more autonomy. And, and I, I'll caveat this with saying this, my characters are not about ageism. They're not about a- anything related to stereotypes of what you see. They're really amalgamations of people that I've met through the years. I've been practicing medicine for 20 years. Mm. And I've dealt with different people and different personalities. And so my characters are really kind of uh, created through little tidbits of different people I've encountered along the way. Yeah, Katz is a really impressive one because he's <laughs> kind of like the voice of – like ancient reason. Yeah. He's like health 1.0's voice. Like, hey, remember we used to do it this mm-hmm. way. Why is it so screwy? He kind of points yeah. out all the screwy stuff. But the truth is like you and I both know going back to the days of health 1.0 isn't the answer. Mm-hmm. It's not the highest practice we can do. We need to transcend that. And what Katz does is he points out, hey, Guys, before we get lost in the sauce of like performance metrics and click boxes and charting and electronic health record and throughput and RVUs and all the other metrics that as an acquired, he, by, when you say acquired, he was probably in private practice or a different group mm-hmm. and some big group bought his practice. Yeah. yeah. And now he's basically saying, but you know, guys, like it's still about taking care of the patients and us not going crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Is that how you see it? or No, nah, it, it is. And, you know, it's funny. One of my favorite comics that I have includes Dr. Katz, where he's talking with another physician, and they're they're talking about the new medical director for quality. And, you know, Dr. Katz, you know, tells the other doctor, hey, have you met the new medical director for metrics? And um, <laughs> and the doctor's like, what are you talking about? You mean the medical director for quality? And he goes, yeah, no, for metrics. He said, it's got nothing to do with quality. It's all about the metrics. You know, and it's, it's really just kind of that, right? I mean, yeah. we have... You know, when you think about metrics, you know, we've got like 1,700 metrics that CMS has created for us to follow across the hospital setting, ambulatory setting, nursing facilities, and other 1,700, Mm. right? You've got another 80 HEDIS metrics. You've got another 57 that Joint Commission has in the hospitals. I mean, we are metric crazy. Mm. And, And the sad part is we're trying to measure things that may not necessarily truly impact patient outcomes. When you look at what we as physicians do, and this is a humble thing to say, you know, only 10 to 20% of what we do impacts patients' overall health care. Yeah. The other 70, 80, 90% are really social determinants of health. The things they're doing when they're not in the hospital, when they're not in the clinic, right? It's, it's what they're eating. It's if they're exposing themselves to, to hazardous materials or dangerous stuff. It's, it's, it's only a part of their overall health. And I think we have to really look at how we provide services in a different way and partner with patients and look at other avenues to truly make them healthier. Yeah. Well, basically what you said is the, is the basis of a health 3.0 approach, which is, hey, if you know 80 to 90% of social determinants of health and their life, yeah. we're only intersecting with their life in a tiny way. Why have we blown it up into this admin, what, what, what Jonathan Bush from formerly of Athena Health yeah. has called the the administrative technocracy. Mm-hmm. So the metrics police, the you know <laughs> click box police, all the other CMS regulations, all that. Yeah. All of this to, to, to turn a patient into a commodity, which is a throughput RVU measure that generates revenue. When our benefit to that patient is, is this, unless we're doing it smart and we don't do it smart. Yeah. We're in a transition phase. So there's nothing wrong with quality measures that measure quality. Yeah but they become metrics when they don't measure quality. Yeah, and I, and, and I think what, what's so difficult about quality metrics, number one, is that um, they're hard to pull. Mm. Most people have to do them manually because our EMRs are not yeah. savvy enough to abstract or extract that data, so we have to hire people to track our quality metrics. Which, by the way, a, a piece of technology has one job, do what technology can do <laughs> that humans 
don't do that well that that technology can do better. Yeah. Abstracting that stuff is exactly what it could do. Well, and we're not even uniform with our quality metrics. Right. If you look at one insurance plan to the next, they have different different, different variables. I right. mean, variables for hemoglobin one C and blood pressure. Even the ranges are variable, right? So you have to serve multiple masters, often at conflict with each other, yep. and you have to serve your conscience to take care of the patient yep. and to keep the lights on financially. So yeah. this is where the moral injury starts. No, totally. And then, you know, when you think about quality metrics that matter to patients and physicians, yeah, yeah. I've got, you know, I've got cardiovascular surgeons and others whose quality metric is, you know, a statin or blood pressure. And I think that's okay. But when you think about it, they say, I'd rather have something more relevant to my specialty, right? Mm. I'd rather be able to measure something that matters to the patient that's something that I care about. Mm. And we haven't really built up standard metrics that matter in a way that's going to affect patient care. Right. In a way, you could fall into the trap of reductionism with metrics and just say, oh, we're reducing everything to a cholesterol value. Mm -hmm. When in fact, we know cholesterol is just one manifestation of many, 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 many things. And in fact, some people with good genetics can have crazy cholesterol and be fine. Some yeah. people with bad genetics can have normal looking cholesterol and be not fine. Mm -hmm. There's inflammation, there's many other aspects of this. And then there's the own, the patient's hopes, dreams, and fears. Like, what do they actually want? Do yeah. they want to live forever? Or do they want, they have certain goals? Goals. They have certain functional goals, certain psychological goals, certain spiritual goals. We don't have metrics for that. Yeah. And and I don't think our AI is ever going to get smart enough to generate metrics for that. So mm -hmm. what we ought to do is have the EHR make uh, make do with anything that is measurable that actually makes sense and take it off our plate so we can do the intangible stuff that requires a human consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that that's one of the themes that goes throughout your strips is that what we've done is we've stripped out the humanity from the heart of this medical thing. And we've turned it into this business Dilbert-like creation. Mm -hmm. And everybody's suffering. Patients are suffering. Like, you know, your chapter two is patient surveys, the quest for positive reviews. <laughs> so what's up with that, dude? Oh, man. This is a triggering topic. Oh, geez. You know. <laughs> I, I need more wine. I'm telling you. I, there's, we're, hopefully we got more bubbles coming. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think- me some woo girl. By the way, does your wife have a website for this? Actually, she does. It's- um, www.woogirlsellers.com. All right, and you'll, I'll put Some that nice in the show notes. nice little nod. Yeah, I yeah. appreciate that. Um, you know- Because it's good. It is really good. Well, thanks, man. Yeah, appreciate fantastic. It. I, I, don't, I don't know why I'm taking credit for it's it. Got she notes, made it. Notes of chocolate. <laughs> notes of- uh, that, Spoken is that, like- Is that pube that I detect? I don't uh, know. I <laughs> hope not. Yeah, it's spoken like a sommelier who doesn't <laughs> she, want a job. She's off camera going, no, no pubes. <laughs> 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 Spoken like a sommelier who doesn't want Does a job. Does not want a job. I don't want a job. Yeah, you need the little golden thing. I know, right? The, the cup, little... you know, what does the sommelier use? Yeah, that's right. It's like a little like affectation that they yeah, wear. Yeah, sorry, yeah. man, my ADHD kicks Dude, in. Dude, hey, join the club. Squirrel. <laughs> Squirrel. Yeah, so what so are we talking patient about? Oh, satisfaction. Yeah, yeah, thanks so for So patient satisfaction is, is really one of those love-hate relationships that doctors have and clinicians for the most part. Because, you know, one of the things we want to do is make sure that our patients are happy with the service that they have. But, you know, somewhere along the lines, it kind of got messed up in that we started getting graded for it, right? Mm. CG caps came in and started saying, we're going to grade you on patient experience. And just to be clear, patient experience and patient satisfaction are two totally different things. How so? How so? Explain that. So patient experience is whether something that was expected to happen actually happened, mm -hmm. right? Uh, did the physician see you within 15 minutes of your scheduled appointment, right? Patient satisfaction was... Did you feel like the parking was close enough to where you needed to be to see the doctor? Mm. It's it's a lot more subjective, right? Mm. It is the expectation that the patient has of what should have happened. I see. So one is much more subjective. One is measurable and objective. Numbers. One tries to be measurable, right. tries to be. Did they call you after the visit to follow up on X, Y, and Z? Exactly. Is, is patient experience. Right. Did the physician yeah. review your medications with you during the visit? I see. Right? Where patient satisfaction is more like, did you enjoy your visit with the doctor? Right. And, you know, when you deal with patient experience, that's a metric that CG Caps uses to help grade us. And it's also a way that organizations get incentivized. And by, by uh, default, they, they incentivize their physicians the same way based mm -hmm. on their scores. Mm -hmm. And the thing with patient experience, I'll start talking about that first. Patient experience is really a, a very small window of, of excellence. And when I say that, I mean, you know, you could have a raw percentage score of 85% of your patients say that you are you did an awesome job, right? And that puts you in the 50th percentile of your peers in the nation. Wow. You could have 90% of your raw percentile say percentage say you did a great job. And that now puts you in the 90th percentile. So like a five to seven mm -hmm. raw percentage score 
swings you from average to above average. Yeah. So and it's narrow. because that pool is so close, mm. right? And, you know, we already know that patient experience scores are based on, okay, when the survey was sent, how the survey was sent, right? Absolutely. How many people responded to the survey, right? Was your sample bias. size was big enough? <clears throat> There's all that stuff. Patient set. I'll, I'll talk about patient set now. So patient set is really the expectation patients have. And I think patients should be really happy with their experience. The thing is, you as a physician can do a really jo good job with your patient in making sure that you've monitored their blood pressure, their medications, made sure that they got their screens done. And the patient may leave there and say, I just didn't feel like he did what I needed him to do. Mm. And nine times out of 10, and you'll know this because one of my favorite videos that you made is Blank Script. Oh, yeah. Nine times narcotics. out of 10, it is the patient saying, I am expecting you to do something for me. Yeah. Antibiotics. Antibiotics. Narcotics. Pill Every to time solve I get problem. sick like this, I know that it's bronchitis and I just, I'm going to be flying out of town. I need you to write me the a script. The only thing that helps me starts with a Z. Yep. The Z pack. I need a Z yes, pack. Exactly. Right? Same thing with pain, right? Uh, anytime I have this injury, this is what I get. Yep. The only thing that helps me starts with a D, dilaudid. <laughs> That's right. And, you know, and I think as doctors, we try to do the right thing. Uh, unfortunately, it may not be what the patient wanted. So that, it leads to that patient satisfaction or dissatisfaction. And this is where patient experience and patient satisfaction can actually be at odds because a patient experience metric may be, you know, they, their pain was addressed in some way, mm -hmm. biopsychosocial addressing of the pain. Yeah. Whereas satisfaction may be, it needs to be addressed in the way that I expect it's addressed as a patient. And that may not necessarily be the way that is best for me. Yeah. Yeah. And there, and there was some data, and I don't know if it's now been debunked or not, but that higher patient satisfaction scores correlate maybe with worse outcomes for patients. Yep. Actually, it's in my book, actually. I nice. quote some of those data. So nice. I'm here with you, man. I'm glad. I'm hey, with this you. is why we get along. Yeah. Brother. I yeah. mean, UCSF did a lot of studies around that. And it showed that physicians are, are physicians who score highest on patient satisfaction mm. in some circumstances mm. were those that were more likely to do whatever it was the patient needed of them. Ah. And actually, I have a comic. I have a few comics in that chapter. And and, and one of my comics has Dr. Katz in it, and it starts with the manager talking to the operational leader. And the operational leader says, Donna, Dr. Katz, man, he's killing it with CG CAP scores. His patient, status, patient experience scores are fantastic. Why don't you go ask him what he's doing so that maybe we can teach the other doctors what it is his secret sauce is so that they can do better. Uh -huh. So Donna goes to meet with Dr. Katz, and she says, Dr. Katz, you have great patient experience scores. I mean, what's your secret? And Dr. Katz looks at her and goes, it's simple. I just give patients prescriptions for whatever they ask for. <laughs> <laughs> that and, is such an old school move. And, and I know it's not. Again, it's satire, <laughs> no, but that, no, right? No, but it's not. But it's not. But statistically, when you read the stats around patients who are most satisfied, who are, have chronic diseases, those patients with the higher satisfaction scores actually have higher mortality rates yeah. in the hospital. Yeah. Um, because there are certain things that might have been they might have been provided that were unnecessary. So uh, you know, as uh, the Rolling Stone says, you know, with satisfaction, you Can't might no you way. might not get what you want, but you just might get what you need, need if yeah. you get a good doctor. Yeah. Th this was looked at again. Uh, Athena's research guys, I remember we did a show about this. We're looking at like they were looking at their EHR pool of data and saying, hey, when is it that doctors are more likely to give inappropriate antibiotic prescriptions? Well, it turns out it's later in the yeah, day end when of the day, tired. Man. I don't want to spend 30 minutes, don't want to spend 30 minutes telling talking this, this patient person that out of it. this is a viral illness. Yeah. You know, and, and now with COVID, man, those discussions get even more complicated. Hang on, I'm just gonna grab a... Uh, sure. I realize that my recording box is causing a lot of noise. And we don't edit this show, so <laughs> I'm going to put this little little dampener nice. over here to keep it from pissing okay. off my mic. All right, back to you, Bob. <laughs> You're not Bob. You're Peter. Yeah, no um, so, so the the patient satisfaction thing is a huge driver of dissatisfaction among healthcare professionals, yeah. and you tap into that. Nurses, in particular, feel like you know this is uh, why, why you know are we supposed to be? Uh, is, does RN stand for you know? Um, what was it? Uh, refreshments and narcotics, mm. basically. And the truth is, no, that's not what it stands for. <laughs> yeah. right? and, yeah. and the more that we can bring this to the fore in terms of understanding, now that doesn't mean that the patient experience doesn't matter. In fact, it matters a lot. Yeah, it matters a lot. Imagine, and and this I actually heard, you know, the the 
a, a big patient satisfaction organization, one of these metrics monsters, part of what I call the measurement industrial complex yeah. that has sprung up around measuring these things, actually told me a beautiful story. And they said, here's an example of patient experience. A woman in the hospital has a miscarriage. What is that patient's experience from the time they come in to the time that they leave? This is an emotionally horrible event. Are they given resources? Are they treated well? What's the tone of the staff? How is their experience? Are they supported? And then you start to go, you know, that is actually crucially important yeah. because you can traumatize someone even more than they're traumatized if you don't understand how that's done. Mm -hmm. But how do you measure that, right? Yeah, and I, I mean, and that's a great story. I mean, I always reflect on, I think it was Cleveland Clinic that mm -hmm. had this video. It still tears me up, you know, mm -hmm. but it's all about, Empathy, oh, that one. right? Yeah, the you know, when it's video, yeah. like it's a black and white and it's got different people in the hospital setting and it's it kind of bubbles, there's a bubble thought on what's going on in that person's head or what's going on in their situation. And that's the thing is we don't always speak it, but you know, people may be going through a lot of stuff. The most belligerent patients, you know, that are the most seem the most intransigent, if you really were to inhabit what's inside them, you would just feel nothing but compassion, Yeah. right? And that's the, pro that's the problem is we don't have the bandwidth for compassion. Well, I mean, try doing it in 15 minutes, right? You're right. treating somebody for their diabetes and hypertension and cholesterol and depression. Most people are really struggling with that right now. It's worse and than trying to chart and trying to code and trying to make sure you capture your quality metrics, all while trying to provide that care that that patient needs for you at that time. It's a lot. It's a lot. And I and I don't want this to sound like we don't care about patients. We really do care about patients, and that's what's contributing to the moral injury we're all feeling, mm. right, is mm. not being able to do what we need. But I think patient satisfaction, patient experience, the, the goal of that should be to improve outcomes for patients so that they can get better experiences and better lives. Somehow along the line, it got kind of it, it, it kind of bifurcated into this, you know, we're now going to, you know, do Yelp scores on you and, yeah. and let you know how you're doing on Yelp. And, you know, and unfortunately, when they do this, you know, there's not even a big enough sample size to say whether somebody did a good job Five or not. Five reviews. Right. And they're usually biased towards people who are angry, yeah, who are willing to go on Yelp and tear you a new one. I've yeah. got I've got a comic also that talks about Yelp and, yeah. and not to slam Yelp because I love Yelp for restaurants. For restaurants, yeah. <laughs> but that also inspired a comic for me, right? You know, yeah. you've got a comic where there's a, a manager talking to a physician that says, you know, I really need to talk to you about your patient satisfaction scores. And he says, well, I thought I was doing great on CG Caps. She goes, yeah, you are, but you're not doing great on Yelp. <laughs> and he says, well, I refuse to be rated by an organization that rates restaurants along with physicians. Yeah. It's, you know? it's, it's, it's demoralizing because they're not the same, you know, you could argue they're both a service industry, but yeah. it's a different magnitude. Yeah. Restaurants have a certain process and expectation. And now that's not to say that, that we can't learn from certain aspects yeah. of hospitality. Yeah. But, and, but yeah. Well, and that's when design thinking comes. That's in. I mean, right. We can apply design thinking to make sure to improve someone's like you said, the experience after having a loss, right? Yeah. A miscarriage or whatever. Walk in that person's shoes and say, what are the core things they're going to need to be able to help That's them? right. Yeah. And, That's and, right. And we can do it well. Yeah. You know, we don't utilize our chaplains enough. We don't, you know, there's so many different resources, mm -hmm. hospice, all this stuff is underutilized and because yeah. it's not, it's not reimbursed. Nope. Yeah, it's which not. which you know you have a chapter on uh, coding. What's the code for that? Right, <laughs> like so much of our time is spent trying to figure out how to get paid. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I, I think it's funny. Coding coding is a whole other animal in itself, right? And it's funny when physicians hear coding, some of them just literally you start to seize. Yeah, yeah. right. I mean, co the whole coding thing started, and it's in my book. I talk about the history of how coding started. Very cool. It was actually based on. In, in England, in London times, back 17th century, they used this thing called London Mortality Bill to track what people died of, uh -huh. right? So from the 17th century into the 18, 1900s, it was used to measure how people died. Mm. And then in the early 1900s, 1920s, 1930s, the World Health Organization kind of took it on, and it got named from International Classification of Death to International Classification of Diseases. I see. And they started tracking what people were sick of. And I think that once we started doing that, which was a good reason, we started trying to capture every single disease that people had. And then we started trying to 
figure out how do we give people credit for seeing these diseases. Mm. And it just blew up, right? We went from 17,000 codes to 70,000 codes. Now we've got CPT codes. Now we've got, you know, all kinds of different types of codes that we're dealing with. Mm. And our physicians, as physicians, clinicians, you know, we're not trained to really say, okay, this person has heart failure. Okay, well, what type of heart failure do they have, right? Is yeah. it right side of heart failure with an ejection fraction of this? What is that? Acute, chronic, with yeah. or without hypertension? As a uh, clinician, it's not going to change how I treat the patient, but now I'm in this game where I have to capture the exact right. ICD-10 code to make sure that I'm given full credit for the work. Right, right. And it, be, it becomes just another cognitive load mm -hmm. on a physician who's cognitive bandwidth should be reserved for caring for this patient, doing yeah. the in intuitive high-level medicine that only human beings can do. Yeah. Whereas you would imagine that if that's important, if it is important to have all these ICD codes and all that, you know, just let's say for data tracking or epidemiology or whatever, for other science, then have the computer figure it out. Yeah. Have the computer listen to natural language in the visit and translate it into codes that make sense. I mean, there's programs, there's AI now, literally where you can have a, a device and I'll, I'll throw a shout out, out to Robin. A Robin device, it's a little, it's like a little AI device that you put on your table so that when you're seeing the patient, you actually are talking to the patient, Heaven forbid. looking at them eye to eye, and you're saying what's going on with them. Yeah. And Robin is able to pick up the diagnoses, any kind of um, CPT codes, any kind of HEDIS metrics, any RAF components, all while you're doing your focus on the patient. Yeah, that's key, that's key. Well, I mean, we need there, to figure this kind there, of stuff There's out. a startup here in town um, called Suki, S-U-K-I. Yeah, I love yeah. Suki. We they, had them on our show. Me. Yeah, oh, cool yeah, 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 they do? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And they, they do similar stuff. It's kind of like, well, hey, take the stuff off the plate. Mm -hmm. That's what we talk about AI all the time. AI is never gonna replace doctors. No. It's gonna be a tool we use no. yeah. to make our lives and the lives of our patients better. And, and, th and that's gonna be key. So that was coding. Now you have a chapter here, leadership and communication. What are you saying? That's the name of the chapter. This this is good. You gotta oh, tell man. you gotta tell me about oh, this. Oh geez. So leadership and communication. This is where you get yourself fired from your group. It, pretty yeah. much. You know, <laughs> this this is the uh, it, it is that challenge, you know, the 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 arm wrestling that occurs between people on the front lines and, and administrators and managers. It it you know, I've I've been in meetings where I've literally listened to CEOs and other executives say, we are doing fantastic. We are killing it on our dashboards. We're hitting every metric we need. We're doing wonderful. And I'm sitting there thinking, I just left a meeting with a bunch of physicians and staff where they're talking about they're not having enough support staff. When they're talking about not having the call center you know, appropriately directing calls where they're talking about things that are vital to patient care, um, but no one is really listening to them because the dashboard metrics don't have any of that included in there, <laughs> right? And so it's like docs and administrators speaking two languages. Two different languages, right. You know, I always joke around that I, you know, I was in private practice in, in West Texas. And I, after a couple of years of being in practice, I actually went back to school to get my MBA because I didn't know the business side of medicine. Yeah. And I was fortunate to do that. And when I came back, it kind of opened my mind up to different ways of seeing things. Mm. But one of the things I always joke with docs about is, you know, I tell them I went to get my MBA so I could speak the language of administrators, right? <laughs> so I tell our docs, I was like, okay, man, anytime you hear an administrator come to you and say, hey, listen, this is a big opportunity for us. I said, <laughs> when you hear the word opportunity, opportunity translates to things we suck at. Ah. So anytime you hear the word opportunity, it means we're doing a terrible job here and these are things we suck at. Got it. Right? When you hear people use the word, this is going to be a journey for us, ah. I say that translates to things that suck to go through. Wow. So be prepared, right? That makes sense. Totally. You could be like a um, professional leadership to doctor translator. Dude, I'm like a or translator, to nurse translator, interpreter, you know, you name it. You Dude, know? that's but, great. Uh, it's those types of things that I think happen with this, physicians and clinicians. This interview is going to be a journey for us, Peter. <laughs> we're going to go through a lot of. I think we have a lot of opportunities. We to have a lot of opportunities <laughs> to really. <laughs> I love it. You know what doesn't have a lot of opportunities or a journey? This wine. It's delicious. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Oh my god! Nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, wine break. Oh man, dude. I see. This is this is. The more you talk, the more I'm like, this is what we need: is this connection between leadership. And 
frontline caregivers that has been tenuous in some organizations, really good. In some, it's just like, oh my God, really? Yeah. It's exactly what you said. They go, oh, we're doing great. We're crushing it on the metrics. And then one room over, people are crying because they're understaffed. They're ready to quit. They're ready to go take a traveling nurse job at 3X the pay yeah. because they're, they're just not gonna do this anymore. Yeah. Right? And, and COVID has made it worse, don't you think? I agree. I mean, I think it's made it really tough. You know, I think about, one of the examples I list in the book is around call centers, right? And huh. I think call centers can be good when done well. Um, I think that they can also n not do so well. Yeah. You know, w w there was a study that w showed what's the difference between the mind of physicians versus managers and administrators when it comes to overall perspective of healthcare. And in, in the research, they showed an example of call centers and what it meant to different people. Now, the perspective from the administrators and managers was that call centers are wonderful. They're the end-all, be-all. They're going to solve everything. They make things less expensive, which is partially true. And they use metrics like, you know, time to answer the phone, mm -hmm. right, and turnaround time to message, right? And their metrics were always great. But when they looked at the physicians and they asked the same question, how do you feel about the call center, they would say, the call center has been nothing but a headache for us, right? Yeah. The good news is they're answering the phone. The bad news is they're just sending messages to the back of my office, so I ended uh, up having to deal with them, right? Uh, the good news is they're scheduling patients. The bad news is they're not scheduling appropriately for the visit that they need. So they schedule a 15-minute appointment, and I've got 30 minutes with them that I need to be able to solve. Oh. So these little disconnects are the things that we have to work on together. When you look at leadership in, in healthcare organizations, the, and, and this might be blasphemy to some people listening, but the best running facilities are facilities that are being run by people with clinical backgrounds. Hell yeah. I will triple down on that. Statistically. Statistically. Studies this is, show that. This is, you talk about follow the science in COVID. Okay, here's the science. Mm -hmm. Clinical people are better leaders in organizations that take care of patients, full stop more profitable, better yep. patient satisfaction and experience, yep. better, less turnover. Preach. Preach, all of man. It, all of Preach. it. All of it. And you're one of those people because you're a family medicine doctor practicing and a leader. Yeah. Now, so you're biased. So the whole thing we just said is horse shit. It's all just confirmation <laughs> bias. Um, back to you. <laughs> yeah, no, no. But, you know, that is part of it, right? And they asked Toby Cosgrove, right? Cleveland Clinic yeah, guy. Cleveland Clinic. He ran one of the best organizations in the country for years. They said, why, why do you think that clinicians – are better in leadership roles in healthcare than others. And he said, plain and simple, credibility. Yeah. He said, physicians and clinicians have credibility because they understand the people on the front lines and those caring for patients in a different way. And it's not to slam non-medical people. We need them too. It's just to say that if we're truly going to impact care and change the way we provide it and provide better outcomes, we need people that can think from a clinical perspective on how to do it better. So let me play devil's advocate for a second because sure. I, I can see the comments already because a lot of, oh, yeah. and, and this is usually both doctors and nurses and other healthcare staff who will say, yeah, it's one thing to have clinical experience. It's another thing to be a total sellout, be so detached from the front lines that you're now drinking that whole uh, opportunity journey Kool-Aid and you're not, um, you're not in touch anymore. And it's actually even worse because you have the credibility of a frontline clinician, but you're behaving like a, one of the worst MBA, like totally disconnected money driven people. Like, how do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And speaking of someone who's probably seen that way or been <laughs> seen that way in the past. The dark the, side. The key, and I mentioned that in my book, I think the key to improving those relationships is to walk in each other's footsteps. Uh -huh. right? How do you do that? Yeah. You, you, I've, had, I've been in organizations where administrators, non-clinical administrators, spend the day or even the week shadowing their staff, mm. right? Getting to understand what are the headaches they're dealing with, right? What are, what are the things that I'm not seeing in you know my ivory tower that people are struggling with? Mm. The other, the flip side of that is having physicians and non -clinical, or clinical staff also do the same thing, being present for some of those major meetings that others have around. Do we continue this service, right? You end up having ethical discernments around, okay, can we continue to have an inpatient rehab facility in this hospital knowing that most of these patients have no funding and, and where there's no way that we can continue to support it? Mm. Include the clinical people in some of those decisions as well because you start understanding from both sides what it is their struggles are. Mm. One side has to keep the lights on. The other side has to keep the patients alive and doing well. Yeah. And you have to have that partnership. And I mentioned dyad relationships for that reason. You have to have partnerships that have non-clinical and clinical people working together to solve the problems together.
Got it. So you have you have both of them. Now there's a couple follow up questions to that, um, and one of them is in the setting of coronavirus and people really having this great resignation where they're like, you know, this is enough. I don't feel valued by leadership. I have people tell me, you know, they, they don't even give us lip service to to the, what we've been through. Mm-hmm. They're asking us to work overtime and then they're hiring travelers at like three X the thing because everyone's quit. How, and, and I've had then healthcare CEOs ask me, how do we retain our staff, mm-hmm. right? And, and part of me just wants to say, you don't because you suck <laughs> and they should go do what they're passionate about because yeah. it's not this, but that's not, that's not really the answer. The answer is, wait, no. So they are passionate about physical therapy. They are passionate about, you know, I, I had a person at a meditation retreat I went to who's a physical therapist and all of her department quit. She's like the only person left and is just working triple X, mm-hmm. but she's passionate about it, but, she, yeah. but she's burning out. That's why she was at the retreat. So how, how do you think about this? No, and, and you know, I'm dealing just with Just walk it. in your shoes type Yeah, of totally, and I'm dealing with it now. I mean, we're yeah. dealing with it. Most healthcare organizations have like 20% vacancy rates right now. Mm, because people are saying, I'd rather not work than keep doing it at this pace, right? right? And to your point, the people that stay, the, the other nurses and frontline people that stay, their reward is now you can get to do double the work. Double the work, yeah. Right, now you get to pick up everybody else's slack. Yeah. And, and that's not fair to them. Right. I think for us, what we need to make sure that we do is value those people well. And when I say value, I mean, make sure they're being paid appropriately, make sure they're being trained appropriately, because to your point, we've got a lot of float nurses and ICs and locums that come in and they do, and I don't want to slam in them because we have great ones, but they may not be trained to do all the things that you need them to do. Correct. Right? And so if you don't onboard them and train them well, then somebody else by default ends up doing some of that work. Yeah, yeah. So we ought to be able to pay them well. We've got to be able to train them well. And we got to be able to find at least partner with our physicians and clinicians and others to say, what are some things that we can all agree to streamline together? Mm. Because half the battle is the variation that people deal with on a day-to-day basis. Mm. A, a, a nurse could be working with one doctor one day, and I'm sure you nurses out there will understand this, and know that this person likes it just this way. And they work with another doctor the next day, and it is totally, totally different, different yeah. right? And I think that as a department or as a care center or whatever setting you're in, if you can come to some baseline agreements on how you're all going to agree to do a little bit of it together, it helps at least smooth out some of this for those people that are just coming on to help out and who may not be as experienced as others to do what's right. Mm-hmm. Does that makes sense. Yeah, it's a re- it's a real challenge, and it's multifocal, right? How do, mm-hmm. how do you but how do you make people feel valued? Yeah, as a leader. Yeah, you know that's the million dollar question, yeah. right? Is is that value component? Yeah, you know when when one of the things I love to read is is uh, Seligman's. He's a psychologist that's written a lot about flourish and doing well, and 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 what he talks about is that. It's like, you know, Maslow's pyramid, right? Everybody has the same core things that they want. But Seligman, I really appreciate because he talks about performance at work. Mm. And he says when people go to work, they want to have a couple of things that they feel. Number one is positive emotions. They want to actually look forward to going to work. Right. Right. They want to have relationships. They want to feel like they're part of a team and they like the people around them. Uh. They want a sense of meaning. They want to feel like what they're doing is really something meaningful. And the last part they want is a sense of accomplishment or achievement. They want to end the day and go, man, I I helped five people today, and I really think that I changed, you know, the direction of this patient's outcomes in my own way. And I think that if we can really start tapping into making people feel those aspects at work, it will help change the dialogue and the the discussion around how people work and and how long they stay. This is great. I took notes on this because I'm speaking for a large physician group tomorrow, and I'm gonna mention some of these things because if you give people the tools, meaning technology, the resources, meaning team, Mm -hmm. and the autonomy, meaning the freedom to make decisions within the purview of their training, they will start to have more likelihood of having positive emotions, deeper relationships, me a sense of meaning and a sense of accomplishment. Yep. You know, my best days as a hospitalist were always that thing. Oh my gosh, every the whole team's firing on all cylinders. I have this great resident, yeah. the social worker crushed it today. Case someone manager brought got donuts. The, someone brought donuts. <laughs> the nurse was on fire, was really nice, everything was beautiful. And and then like the patient said thank you and they felt really connected. Mm-hmm. They said something beautiful that made me feel like there was a meaning to my life and I felt accomplished because I got all the patients what they needed. I felt like I had the tools and the resources, the autonomy to do it. And those are the best days. Yeah, yeah. The worst days are where 
every single one of those things is firing a blank. Yeah. That can happen. Mm -hmm. You know, the team is dysfunctional because we're all burned out and unhappy and we're blaming each other. The relationships are falling apart. Someone the, calls in sick. Someone calls in sick and you the know, bell. you're like, I know that guy's on the beach right now because he just <laughs> needs a mental health yeah, day. Yeah, I just saw him on Instagram. And, yeah, I saw him on Instagram like, hey, yo, with a duck <laughs> face yeah, and all up? that. Drink, hey, yo, my woo girl. Woo girl, what up? Yo, z Dog, <laughs> empty. Yo, <laughs> hey fam, up? how y'all doing? Anyways, Fourth everybody bottle, in the hospital just fighting that COVID. <laughs> it's like, come on, dude. Um, um, so, you know, it's so, you know, I hear from people that are quitting and, and they, and they tell me you can just check these boxes negative, you know? So as a leader and yeah. a clinician, this is where that opportunity and that challenge is. Definitely. And yeah. I, I think you hit on the autonomy part, which is something that we take for granted. Mm. People want to be able to do what they need to do at the front line in, in a way that helps them and the patients, right? My philosophy and my mantra has always been when we put in a process or something into the care center. Number one, it has to be good for the patient. Mm. Number two, it has to be good for the providers and caregivers. And number three, it has to be done effectively and efficiently. Mm. If it doesn't meet those criteria, then we're just going to spin our wheels and we're going to put something in place that's going to, you know, drag people down. Yeah. You know, and I think as a leader, as a, as a leader of, of, med of a medical group and for other executives out there, one of the most humbling things for us to understand is we're too far removed from some of those things that matter to patients and we should allow those people to be able to make decisions on how to do it better. Yeah, 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 really you know, the people who know best. In the you know, you mentioned the chapter on leadership and management, you know, the things that they have a lot of studies that talk about how decisions are made in large organizations. Mm. And what they find is number one, there when you have a very large bureaucratic organization, several things happen. Number one, as much as a third of the overall cost go to that layer of management That's and bureaucracy. 30%, right. yeah. Number two, you've got people that are too far removed from a decision to really understand it. Yep. Number three, you've usually got somebody that's such a high executive level person that everyone's afraid to question them. Yeah. Their decision. Yeah. And then number four, which is the most painful, you probably have to go through like four or five layers of approval. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've worked in organizations where they did capital planning, which, you know, it's, it's, you have to be very careful of capital planning. But if you wanted something, a building or a facility or something raised, you had to submit it a year and a half ahead of time. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And hope that that was going to eventually get approved and, and, and addressed. Right. Yeah, so the, the bureaucratic layers that you have to go through. I, I know this even when I speak for an organization, it has to go through multiple layers of meetings and approvals. Mm. And well, is Z Dog a too much of a loose cannon? Or yeah. is, is he going to say anything about this? Because right. we don't want that. So we have this committee that approves dollar amounts up to this. If it That's gets right. above this dollar amount, then it goes to this committee. If it gets above this dollar amount, then it goes to this committee. Exactly. And as, as someone with infinite speaking fees, like they're, they approach the asymptote of infinity. Is that right? Imagine the committees I have to go through. Like I have to go through the president of the U.S. Like Biden has to stamp that's off right, man. any talk I do for like the local Rotary Club. Yeah, that's how it, it goes. needs, you know. Yeah. So I, I think that we have some leadership opportunities to help mm -hmm. empower the people that are taking care of our patients in a different way. Talk to me about um, electronic health records because there's a chapter on that, man. This is good. Like This oh is like goodness. everything we've been talking about for so many years oh, and you put it in man. one book. It's great. Yeah, electronic health records. <laughs> I can say statistically electronic health records are one of the biggest factors in, in contributing to people having moral injury and mm. not wanting to practice anymore. Yeah. You know, we... I think you describe, you know, EMRs the best when you call them glorified cash registers. Mm. You know, I think that, that the EMR was made to capture a lot of things, but not necessarily to take care of the patient mm. or those providing that care. You know, I've got actually one comic in there where I talk about um, Dr. Katz, who's, you know, talking to another doctor. He's like, look, man, I'm, I'm spending all my evenings just charting in the electronic medical records. Mm. And, and the other doc's like, yeah, I mean, those EMRs can be tough. And he goes, you know, I used to think, and I quoted you, I said, I used to think EMRs were just glorified cash registers, but now I know why they're called EMRs. And he says, why is that? He goes, because they lead to early mandatory retirement. <laughs> And I saw that coming. It's great. And uh, and it's true, you know, and I have to give, you know, Dr. Jane Sy is one of our docs, and she actually talked to me about this. She said, you know, one of my docs says that the EMR is going to lead to early mandatory totally. retirement. I've had many docs tell me that. And there's studies that show that statistically, yeah. that physicians are more likely to shorten their careers if they're a little bit older and towards the end when they say it's just not worth it. And it's because of EHRs. And you know what? We talked earlier about leadership being disconnected from decision-making, from frontline decisions. So they're so far removed. They can yeah. be, right? 
imagine what the Epic engineers are like, God. right? Or any of these big EHRs, Cerner, yeah. Athena, any of them. Mm -hmm. They're so disconnected from that frontline clinician, even though they have like a token doc or two on the staff, they have no idea. And I've talked to some of these guys, you know, and, and uh, it's not good. They're, they're condescending to doctors. They feel like they know the right answer. It's like, you don't take care of the patients anymore. Yeah. Right? Well, and they, and they compound the factor by saying, listen, this is our EMR. We're not going to open it up to anybody else. Right, exactly. We're not going to be interoperable to anyone else. Walled so garden, whatever yeah. data you have, scan it in. Make sure that they scan it in. We'll put it into a miscellaneous file where no one else will find it because mm -hmm. docs are too busy to say, where am I going to find the last admission from this patient that was outside of this epic EMR? Right. And how, how much does that, how people, patients don't realize this, the lack of the duplication and the lack of accessibility of mm -hmm. EHRs drives up cost, number one, because you redo procedures. Yeah, I don't you, have your lab, so I'm gonna go ahead and do I'm gonna go again. ahead and do them again, because <laughs> I don't want to get sued, which we're gonna talk about. Yep. Um, or uh, worse yet, I'm gonna do a procedure that was already done because you don't really know what was done and it was some other outside place. And then you get a complication from the procedure or from the diagnostic or an iatrogenic uh, problem mm -hmm. that we caused. Well, that contributes to the medical error problem, yeah. right? So this is a solvable issue. It requires political will, it requires technological prowess, and it requires uh, some degree of motivation. It seems like we don't have those things colliding in a way that's gonna make it work. Yeah, well, and, and even worse so, I mean, you, you look at physicians and clinicians spending 50% of their time seeing patients, the other 50% just charting. Charting. I mean, come on. So, so we talk about best days, worst days. My best days were when the residents wrote my notes for me. That was it. <laughs> when that went away and I had to write longer and longer notes and Medicare rules and stuff changed and I couldn't just sign off on resident notes and they were doing less and less because they had work hour rules, then it became a job that became instantly harder. And the thing was, now I couldn't spend as much time with the patient in the yeah. room as a hospitalist. I used to spend like an hour with the patient sitting there at the bedside, holding the hand, going through everything because I like to teach. So, oh, here's my chance to sure. really educate this person so they don't come back. And then it was net, then it was like a U-turn at the bed and go chart all the things that I should have talked about, you know, where I said, hey, don't smoke, don't do this, da, 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 yeah, da. Yeah, yeah. click, 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 mm -hmm. mission accomplished. Yep. Doesn't, it doesn't work. Yeah, well, and you lost that soul. I, I, and maybe yeah. I'm just older, but you lose the soul of what the note was, right? You used to be able to write a progress note that kind of gave a good Capture. story of the patient. Yeah. Now it's so templated out. I only read the assessment and plan. I don't even yeah. read the notes. The I rest of the it's garbage. I don't read anything. All I'm like, boilerplate okay, copy Okay, what's the diagnosis and what did you give them? That's, That's right. it. And even those AMPs have been copied and pasted and copied and pasted into oblivion. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes they even just pull in the diagnostic codes from the problem list and mm -hmm. then they just start scribbling underneath yeah. it and type. It, part of the thing about writing notes too, so what I found is that there's some cognitive connection with actually writing with your hand mm -hmm. that allows you to understand the patient's story better. Well, and there's studies that show that. When you write yeah. things down by hand, you remember them better and it actually helps you explain things in a different way. There you go. There's a lot of research it, behind that. There's an organic human process. Now, maybe the next generation that's raised entirely on computers will be different, but until then, we're still with this. So what I used to do is I would talk, to, like you say you're my patient, I'd be like, hey, Peter, like, so tell me what's going on. So you had chest pain for how long and how long? And I'd be writing it down yeah. writing it. I take some little notes. I doodle a little doodle because sometimes I get bored with a 90 year old <laughs> telling me their life story and they have mild dementia. And it's like, but, but in the end, then what I would do is I go, okay, I know what to do with this patient. Mm -hmm. Then I would just like go, okay, blah, 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 type, 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 type. That would take another 10 minutes of typing. That was a total waste of time. Yep. And if there was a way that just the computer could translate my scribble into a note, wouldn't that be great? Yeah. And I agree. And again, there's resources out there nowadays. There's, well, there's scribes. The yep. Scribes have been around for a while yep. and they've been proven to pay for themselves when done the right way. When done correctly. But there's, yeah. you know, there's AI and there's other types of things that you can actually talk to the patient that can capture a lot of this for you. Yeah. We need to get back to the essence of taking care of our patients the way we, we've we had in the past, but also in a quality manner. Right. And that that's the heart of Health 3.0 is mm -hmm. technology that enables the human relationship a payment model that enables us to just do the right thing for patients and we get paid. Mm -hmm. Just do whatever's the right thing and give us the tools, resources, and autonomy to do that. Yeah. Make it a relationship-based care model, not just with patients, but with each other so that we feel accountable to each other. That's key. Without accountability, that's why I think the distinction between often the isolated private practice 
doc who isn't in a group or isn't, it can be very tricky because there's no, you can just do anything you like. Yeah. And it becomes a, a really isolating and siloed kind of way to be, as opposed to say the opposite extreme where you're in a group where everybody's rigid and you have to have these checklists and so on, then, then you lose autonomy there. So there's a balance between mm -hmm. them, yeah. That's so true. How, how's your thinking on, you have a chapter on basically malpractice. The best offense is a good defense. <laughs> Tell me about that. Well, I mean, I, I I don't know, Zubin, I don't know if that makes him comfortable, but you know, I don't know if you've ever been sued. I can tell you that I've been, Not named, yet. I've been named in a lawsuit twice. Yeah. It's and common. I, Most doctors, right? Over 50% of yeah. physicians 50 and older have been in a lawsuit, yeah. involved in a lawsuit. And, and I think that all of us have that, you know, beneficence. We want to take care of our patients. We want to do the right thing. We, the last thing we want to do is harm a patient. Mm. But there's nothing more traumatizing to clinicians than to be involved in a lawsuit. Absolutely. Number one, to your point, you feel very guilty because mm -hmm. the outcomes weren't necessarily what you thought. Yep. But number two, it is an emotional interrogation for you. It is questions and depositions and time consuming and all these other aspects away from work um, to deal with something like this. And when you look at the statistics, over 65, 70% of lawsuits are end with no fault. Yeah. Right? And, and what we're challenged with now is that the fear of litigation, depending on what state you're in, they could come after your your malpractice insurance and whatever's not covered ends up being owed by you. Right. Yeah, right? So that fear actually makes people start practicing in different ways. And I talk about positive defensive medicine and I talk about negative defensive mm -hmm. medicine in my book. Positive defensive medicine is like you come in and you say, hey, look, doc, uh, you know, I'm not feeling well and, you know, it's just my throat's been hurting and, you know, it's been going on for a few weeks, uh, you know, and, and I'm not sure what it is. And I'm really worried because my uncle had, you know, thyroid cancer and so-and-so had this. And, and I'd really like you to do X, Y, and Z. Mm. And you examine the patient. You go, you know, kind of feels, I feel a lymph node a little swollen. But I see your, you know, your throat's a little red. It might be a little pharyngitis. We could try to do this. And they say, well, no, I'd really like you to work me up. Mm. You know, I want the full gamut. Mm. So positive defensive medicine is me saying, I don't think you have this but I'm going to order everything under the sun and mm. let's go ahead and get a thyroid ultrasound and everything else for mm. you, right? Mm. That is me saying, I don't want to make sure there's nothing that's going to be litigious out of this, even though my gut tells me- It's okay. There's a 99% chance that you do not have what you're worried about. Yeah. Now, negative defensive medicine is when you're practicing somewhere and you know, and there's studies around inner cities and others, and you're taking care of a patient who needs some care, but you're worried that they're not going to follow through with it. So you don't even initiate the care. Mm. You say, I am not going to do this surgical case because the risk factors for this patient are too high and I don't want to get sued. So I'm just mm. going to refer them to the county hospital and let them deal with this patient because I don't want some negative outcome to come out. Right. And, and, my, and my quality metrics will suffer. You hit it Especially on head. for surgeons. And I mentioned yeah. quality metrics. That's in the chapter as well around how people avoid certain patients mm. because they don't want to be impacted from a quality perspective, but from a litigious perspective. Yeah. You know, and we have some states that have no caps on, you know, the, the uh, non-monetary aspects, the medical aspects, the behavioral aspects of patients' outcomes, right? Yeah. And we need to find ways to be able to... Make sure that we reward patients for what they've gone through, but also understanding pain and suffering is one of those kind of gray things that can mm. be very broad. Yeah. And and that's kind of a big misnomer for some people. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a huge problem. And I think patients also don't understand, you know, again, you're either gonna get the whole gamut of things that you don't need and could cause harm actually as positive offensive medicine, which I've never actually heard the distinction. This is really interesting. Yeah. and. Negative defensive medicine, well, I'm just not, I'm not going to do that surgery on you because you're so high risk. Whereas someone at a county who doesn't have, say, that negative uh, aversion would do the surgery, knowing and give you the disclosures that it's going to be high risk and yeah. would do it. Yeah. Yeah. When you think about lawsuits and you think about the, the rewards for those people that win a lawsuit, where does most of that money go? To the lawyers. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> the, some states have been actually very having have a lot of foresight in saying we're going to cap the percentage that the attorney fee can be. Mm. Other states have not, mm. and lawyers have gotten as much as fifty percent of the reward. 
Yeah, it's crazy. And, and, you know, California's actually got something coming up next year where they're looking, there's attorneys that are lobbying to, re, to eliminate the cap on attorney rewards. Oh, Lord. Yeah. And so that actually, there's a lot of studies around states that don't have caps on what the attorney fee gets or the attorney reward gets have much higher lawsuits than others. Mm. And so that's it, something it else that we've got to work on. It drives up costs across the board too. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and this is the thing, like we do need to hold mistakes accountable. I agree completely. But, and I say that in my book. And you say that in the book. But, but one of the things that I've noticed is that you have to be transparent with patients. If mm -hmm. you try to hide something or you don't apologize or if there's a mistake, you don't own it and talk about it with the patient, you're much more likely to get sued. Yeah. And so there's and, always and some be places that. have, they've instituted candor training around that, right? right? Is there a mistake? If a mistake was made, you actually let the patient and their family know. Yeah, yeah. And you have to acknowledge that. And that, you know, you asked, have I been sued? And the answer is no, but I have made mistakes. And mm -hmm. I've had to basically go in front of families and say, you know, I made this mistake that really harmed your loved one. And that is extremely hard, yeah. but it is much, much, much less hard than getting sued and then going into court and having to defend yourself because then you start to, the inner shame is still there, yeah. but the outer defenses then create a cognitive dissonance, you know, where you just wanna I say, yeah, I, I made a mistake. <laughs> like I've learned no. from it, I'm so sorry, mm -hmm. yeah. I think one of the biggest things, one of the biggest gaps we have in healthcare is that we don't share mistakes. Mm -hmm. When you look at healthcare organizations, when you look at M and M's, you know we've all yeah. been in those oh, yeah. situations in hospitals where something ended up terrible, a terrible outcome, right? Right. And we sit in those morbidity and mortality rounds, and they talk about the case, but it's it's not you know it's it's non discoverable. It's it's under peer review, and once you leave the room, you can't discuss it. Right. If you could have all of the hospital organizations get together and say, what were the five major negative outcomes you had in your hospital this year? Yeah. And what did you learn from them? And you allowed the other hospitals to share their mistakes yeah. where people go, oh my, we did the same yeah. thing. Think how much improvement you'd have. Dude, we yeah. could do that. But we're so, afraid, we're so afraid of litigation. We're so afraid of other aspects of risk that everything is something that's kept under, you know, close guard. I, you know, I had a crazy idea just now and I, I think it would be crazy, but what if you let families into m and Yeah. Wouldn't that be something? I think it would be great. It would be amazing because they would feel... They would go on the journey and be closer to closure, whether or not there's litigation. Now, a lawyer would say probably that's a terrible idea because you know X, Y, and Z. But man, you know we're, because they're lawyers. Because they're lawyers, <laughs> and the rest of us are humans. Yeah, and, and we want people to know that. I mean, remember Sorry, lawyers, in the time sorry. when you were in the ER and there was somebody passing, you'd let the patient actually, the family actually watch the while you were trying to take care of the patient. Right, right, right. And and now there's a lot of fear around these things. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I wanna wrap up by, because we've gone through a lot of your book and we haven't even scratched the surface <laughs> of this thing. I think people should buy the book. We're gonna give links, but I wanna ask about you because you're the son of Mexican immigrants? That's right. So it, my family was, uh, they've been in, in Texas since Texas was Mexico. You're kidding. Yeah. So yeah. old school. A very old school. Like pre-Alamo days. <laughs> you could say that. That's awesome. Which part of Texas? <laughs> um, West Texas. West, so like where? Yeah, so my I grew up in Fort Stockton, but I was born in Odessa, Texas. Odessa, yeah. When I say Odessa, people just know it for home of Friday Night Lights. That's where Odessa <laughs> That's <Permian> right. was. <laughs> I've but, been yeah. out to Lubbock, gave yeah, a talk out there. there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Love, love me some West Texas. Yeah. A little dusty out there. Pretty much so. Yeah. <laughs> my dusty. wife's trying not to laugh on the side <laughs> over here. <laughs> <laughs> and And... How did you learn to draw like you do in this book? And you oh did the cover God. art too. Look at this Jeez. cover art, you guys. Like, this is like Sisyphus pushing the rock. And and in this rock, this is so clever, by the way. In this rock are all the things that we struggle in in healthcare: productivity, surveys, in basket, electronic health records, meetings, management, time, regulations, prior auth, staffing, leadership, denials, interruptions, coding, resources, <laughs> charting. It's giving me chest pain, dog. Rules, bureaucracy, autonomy, meaning. Patient satisfaction, autonomy's here twice. Yeah, that's, there's a few of them, dude. Lions and so tigers did, and bears. Oh my! <laughs> how did you? How did you get this? You know, I've always loved to draw uh, yeah. since I was a kid. You know, I think all of us loved drawing when we were kids, right? But you reach a certain age where people go, "Your drawing sucks. Yours is pretty good. Yep. Keep doing it." Right? Yep. Yep. Um, but I've always drawn. I had an older brother, Danny, that was that was a big artist, and he kind of inspired me. And uh, it's funny, every time people ask me about my drawing, I'm looking over at my wife because um, <laughs> I used to always want to be an architect. Yeah. And um, my wife wanted to too. Yeah. yeah. I, I just love 
drawing houses and designing houses. Of course, my mind thought different. So the houses I made were like triangles and circles and obelisks. They're just odd shaped, different look houses. And uh, I remember when Vivian and I were dating, I was like, my my architecture, you know, drawing draft board was something I didn't share with much. But I was like, you know, we're getting pretty serious. Maybe I should show her some of my stuff and let her know. <laughs> Did you make fun of him? Oh, my God. Dude, I, I showed her my artwork. <laughs> and she's looking at it. She's totally quiet. And she's kind of going through and going through. And I'm like waiting for that positive affirmation, right? And she's like, you know, I think it's a great idea that you went into medicine. <laughs> It's like crushed. I'm oh, like, dude, devastated. She, she she totally kept it. You yeah. married the right person. I did because Point. my wife did the same thing. Like I used to play guitar, and I play guitar for her early on, and she's like, "Whatever, dude. This is. <laughs> like, I've heard people play better guitar than this." And yeah. I was like, but my dreams of being a rock star. Yeah, you dash, yeah. Like, We've been don't married be twenty two years. It's funny. I mentioned my knee surgery um, last week. I had arthroscopic knee surgery, and a few nights before that, I had this dream that like the surgery went bad and oh. the joint got infected, and they're gonna have to go clean it up. And and that next morning, I told my wife, I was like, I didn't sleep with the crap because you know I was thinking about the surgery and it went bad. And you know I was waiting for her to say, I'm so sorry. You know that must have been really tough on you. She's like, What? Are you gonna be a big punk about this <laughs> she's like you need to cowboy up this is a regular routine surgery nothing's gonna happen to you dude you married the, the mm -hmm. you married so above your pay grade. i was like thank you thank you it's like, <laughs> guys need that I, I we're the we biggest do. wusses yeah, like, I was. I was you, like, when you got your second dose of vaccine i bet you were like oh, yeah, it my hurts. arm's heavy my arm's heavy <laughs> i get some fever and she was like shut up yeah that's yeah. awesome did yeah, you want to say hi she's like fun. She's like hell no, <laughs> uh, dude. Yeah, you married yeah. well. Um, well. Thanks. Yeah, dude. yeah, and and I mean the what I love about this, and that's how we initially connected, is that. And look, I'm even an endorsement on the you back. You are. You're my number that. one at the top. I love it, dude. Yeah. I was like, whoever Eric Wall is, suck it, dude. I, t <laughs> I took your number one spot. Um, this is a manifestation of your authentic being. This is who you are. You're, you've combined your clinical stuff, your leadership stuff, your MBA so that you could learn all the words and your art and your drive to like make the world better into a thing. This is authentically you. If more people in healthcare allowed their authenticity to shine despite the risk, because you got, oh, you yeah. got risk. I took a lot of heat. You took heat and, and, and we'd be better off, right? Like I'm better off having talked to you here. Like I've learned more about stuff that I think about all the time because you're seeing it from a different angle. You're seeing it not just from leadership, but as somebody who's trying to artistically express it, right? So I really wanna thank you, man. Like well, thanks, I think Evan. this is awesome. You're gonna inspire people. Appreciate you having me on and, and thanks for allowing us to sip some bubbles Dude, along the way. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna science the crap out of this <laughs> a little bit more. Mm. Man, you know, this is, even though the bubbles have sort of evaporated since we've been talking, yeah. that is just really good. Yeah, It does, it, have those, it has those notes of chocolate. And yeah. on the description, you know, there's there's chocolate in the description, which is interesting. So I wonder if I was incepted, but I think I actually- You knew it. I, I'm telling you, it's a sommelier thing before you said what you said earlier. You were a sommelier. Dude, I'm telling you, in a previous life, I was a, a wine snob. Were you really? In this, in this life, I'm too broke to be a wine snob. <laughs> <laughs> I, I go to, I get the two buck chuck and I'm like, this is- Oh, um, that's Chow Shaw, man. Delightful. Can't go wrong. 100% tannins. Yeah. Is that a thing? <laughs> it's, uh... <laughs> Love it. 100% acidity yeah, and 95% percent tannins <laughs> that adds up to 195 yeah, percent man what a joy and um your wife is wonderful you're you're a very lucky man and i think um people who work with you are lucky to have you and we're lucky to have you on the show guys um links to the book doc related links to his website links to the wine woo girl woo girl this is great and um <laughs> we'll be in the show notes if you like what we do um you can support our show because we don't really have big corporate sponsors. We're not like Joe Rogan, where I'm like, you know, this penis enlargement device that I've been using is just <laughs> on point. Uh, I've, I've gotten three or four microns. Oh, I love that, more. microns. Microns, you know, I, you know, I measure it in uh, statistically significant okay, numbers, like microns. Um, you become a supporter of our show, zdogmd.com forward slash supporters. My favorite platform is locals, zdogmd.locals.com, because 
they don't take a big chunk of your money and it's this beautiful group that interacts with each other. You're on Locals. Yeah, I am. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Yeah, it's really great. It's like people put their own comment, like Peter puts his strips up there. People get mm -hmm. to weigh in. It's really fantastic. And Comic strips. Oh, oh. <laughs> thank you for the clarification. <laughs> Spoken like a true administrator. Yes, yes. Uh, I want to clarify not, in, very in clearly. no way remotely. HR. Revealing anything. There's zero stripping, 100% <laughs> comic stripping, and also stripping. Um <laughs> So thank you guys, share the show, and uh, Peter, thanks a million. Hey, thanks a lot, Z. Appreciate and it, man. We are out, peace.